So hello everybody. <clears throat> so we'll have a brief nine day course. Uh, today's the first day. Uh, and the text that will follow is fording, parting from the four attachments. Um, or another way of putting it, uh, parting from the four graspings. And it's written by a Sakya Lama who lived in the late uh, 12th, early 13th century, named Nupa Rigsen Drak. And he was probably a student of Drakpa Gyaltsen, who wrote a longer version of um, Parting from the Four Attachments, the ones that we chant at the Abbey after lunch. So this course came about in quite an interesting way because theoretically I should be in Holland right now. <laughs> and uh, we had this whole you know, teaching tour planned out. I was going to... Uh, Sacramento, and then going to Holland, and then Germany, and then Russia. And then everything changed. Imagine that. <clears throat> and so the whole trip had to get canceled. <clears throat> uh, we canceled it uh, kind of early, you know, because of the threat of the vi virus. But now there's no planes, so I couldn't even go there if I wanted to. Yeah, because there's, there's no planes going to Europe and Russia right now. Uh, so I thought, let's just do something online, and let's open it up so that people from all the different centers where I would have gone uh, can listen, and people in the U.S. who have mornings free can listen, <clears throat> and people in France had been inviting me. The people in Israel had been inviting me. I wasn't going this year, but now they too can join in. So uh, it works out uh, quite well. So although we aren't sitting in the same room, uh, we can still have a heart-to-heart -heart connection. Okay? And that's what is really important, and we're really sharing the Dharma in doing this. So our outline uh, each day is we'll start with a few short uh, recitations, then have just a couple of minutes of silent meditation to calm the mind, cultivate our motivation, or sometimes I might lead a motivation. It depends on how I'm feeling that day. And uh, then afterwards, we'll have the Dharma talk. And if I don't talk too long, we'll have time for questions and maybe answers. If I talk too long, then uh, please write your questions down, send them to us, and then I'll start the next day's teaching with your questions. Okay? So I won't guarantee to uh, go through all the questions because sometimes uh, doing that would mean that we never get to any teachings. Uh, but I'll do what is possible. One thing uh, that I would really like you to take away from this, this brief course is the whole idea of uh, interdependence and causality, or what they call mere conditionality. And I remember many years ago, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, responded to a question where somebody asked him, what would be the Buddha's brand? You know, what would be the, uh, his, um, what would synthesize what the Buddha uh, was trying to get across to us? And His Holiness said, dependent arising. So this was many years ago, and I didn't understand things so well, and I thought, gee, why did he say dependent arising? Why didn't he say compassion? Why didn't he say bodhicitta? Why doesn't, didn't he say the wisdom realizing emptiness? Why did he say dependent arising? 
So that's kind of been my, my Zen koan for a number of years. And then uh, recently, when I've been uh, working on one of the volumes of the book, that I'm, the series of books I'm doing with His Holiness, uh, you know, working on the chapters about emptiness. And of course, you talk about emptiness and dependent arising keeps coming again and again and again, and emptiness dawning as the meaning of dependent arising, and dependent arising dawning on the meaning as the meaning of emptiness. So, okay, I had heard that before, you know, and of course, you know, dependent arising fit, fits in there. But then I started thinking more uh, about the entire path, which is what we'll be covering during this brief course. And every single aspect of the path involves dependent arising. Yeah. So even if we're looking at uh, the three principal aspects of the path, one, which is one way to synthesize the important uh, meditations, to cultivate renunciation of samsara and the uh, aspiration for liberation, that is based on, you know, primarily understanding karma and the disadvantages of samsara. To understand karma, what's karma all about? Causality. It's one system of causality. And when you think about karma, then you have to be thinking about ethical conduct which is the first of the three higher trainings, and which comes in the context of uh, the Shravaka vehicle, the Bodhisattva vehicle, the Tantric vehicle, there, you know. So ethical conduct, karma, you know, all the whole principle be, behind that is causality, dependence. Then, the second principal aspect of the path, bodhicitta. How does dependent arising figure in there? Well, you know, we're dependent on other sentient beings just to stay alive. We're dependent on them to practice the path. To attain awakening, we generate bodhicitta for other sentient beings. So we depend on them as being the object of uh, our compassion, and the compassion is what stimulates us to seek full awakening. Okay, so there's dependent arising again. And especially uh, thinking about bodhicitta, how and how intertwined our lives are with, with the lives of other sentient beings, and really seeing how what we do matters. Yeah? And many people in the world nowadays feel like, what I do doesn't matter. Yeah? And especially, you know, here we're in the middle of a pandemic, and it's like, what I do doesn't matter. I can't can make all the masks and PPE appear in the hospitals. I can't control the government policy. I can't control the, the virus. Uh, you know, I, I can't do anything. And that attitude is completely uh, wrong. Yeah, Because what we do matters. So you can see that, you know, from the doctors and the healthcare professionals who are putting their lives on the, on the line to save other people's lives. What they do matters. But what we do matters too. If we don't, um, you know, respect social distancing, if we don't uh, try and keep ourselves healthy, uh, if we don't shelter at, at home, but instead just go out and do what we want, that affects other living beings. Yeah. And we could catch the virus, we could give the virus. Yeah. So what we do really matters. That's just one example. What we say matters too. 
not just what we do, but what we say to other people. We can encourage them. We can discourage them. Our speech is very powerful. Yeah, we can turn it into a weapon of mass destruction if we want to. Or we can make our speech into, you know, dazzling, brilliant light that spreads joy. It's up to us. And then all of this is rooted in our mind and what's going on in our mind. Yeah, and are we letting our minds being overwhelmed by ignorance, anger, and attachment? And especially in the coronavirus days, are we letting our minds be overwhelmed by anxiety and fear? Yeah, and just like, you know, walking around like that all the time. Um, as if we can't control that at all, as if we have no choice but to be paralyzed by anxiety. So, you know, when we think about dependent arising, we have to think, too, that what we think, what we say, what we do matters. Okay? And what we... The, the, the thing is, okay... We often wait until the result has come to try and act and improve the situation. Okay? But once the result has started to ripen, there isn't always so much we can do. There's always something we can do. What we do matters. But the real time yeah, to exert in influence and use dependent arising, causal dependency to our advantage, is in the causal stage. Yeah, and that, you know, depends on keeping good ethical conduct. The other place where uh, causal where dependence is really important too is when the result arises. How do we respond to it? Not respond in the sense of running around crazy trying to change the external situation, which if we can do is fine, that's good, but to work with it again karmically and change the internal situation so that instead of responding to, again, the virus, with freak out, which, what kind of karma does that create? Freak out karma. It creates freak out karma. Yeah, what kind of result is freak out karma going to bring in the future? More freak outs. Okay? So, you know, if, but if we respond to a situation, you know, with calmness and really see, okay, you know, how can I have compassion in this situation? How can I keep ethical conduct in this situation? How can I make wise decisions that benefit self and others in this situation? <clears throat> so if, again, all of that is causality, isn't it? Deciding what causes we want to create based on what kind of results we want to have. Okay? So, you know, if we look at the Buddha's slogan, the Buddha's brand as dependent arising, it comes up throughout uh, the entire path in different ways, showing us how uh, we are dependent and interconnected with others. So I, I see also in the um, coronavirus thing, and uh, this is a little introduction. We will get to the text sometime. But um, lots of people, from what I'm reading, uh, feel loneliness during uh, the time of being shut in, okay? And I think especially in cities, that 
is important, you know, people feel that because they really can't go outside their flat or their house, especially people living in flats. In a house, maybe you have a backyard, you can go out. But people in cities, you can walk down the street maybe, walk your dog, but, uh, you know, you're very much confined indoors. And so people tend to feel lonely. Okay, so here's how dependent arising can be an antidote for loneliness too. Because when you think about it, we're never alone. Yeah, we're never alone. We always exist in relation to other living beings. So sometimes we encounter beginning Dharma practitioners. I was like this, true confession. We want to learn the teachings, go up to the mountains, not see anybody, meditate and develop compassion for the world, and get enlightened ASAP. Okay? That was our goal. And when we're in the mountains, we won't be lonely. We're separated from all those jerks that we're meditating on compassion towards. Yeah, but all these people who just bug us. Yeah, but we will not miss them at all. But they better bring us food while we're up on the mountain. (laughs) Okay, this is how our crazy mind works, isn't it? So, you know, we have this idea of I'm going to be the renounced stoic meditator, you know, deeply involved in profound meditation on... Mahamudra and Dzogchen and the union of bliss and emptiness. And we totally forget that we live in relationship to every living being. And our our compassion becomes theoretical. Because it's so easy to cultivate compassion when you're not around the people who don't do what you don't like. Yeah, it's so easy to have compassion for them then. Okay? But it's much harder when you're mixed in. But we're always mixed in at some level, aren't we? Yeah. Even you're up alone in the mountains. Yeah, who brings you food? Yeah, it's not magically appearing. Other sentient beings bring it to you. And this whole thing of, of sentient beings being the object of our compassion. I remember my teacher one time when he was teaching this and hammering it in, and he said, every single insect... Your enlightenment, your awakening depends on every single insect. Because if you leave one sentient being out of your compassion, of your bodhicitta, you don't have bodhicitta anymore. If you don't have bodhicitta, you can't get awakened. And I was like, Oh my goodness, you mean my enlightenment depends on that cockroach? And I remember sitting after that, sitting in a field, we were up above Manali, and sitting in a field, and there were all these insects around. And I just meditated, looking at each one, thinking, My enlightenment depends on you. And my enlightenment depends on you. And my enlightenment depends on you. It was really quite um, eye-opening to do that. Yeah? To see the level of dependence that we have. Yeah? And then, of course, thinking about emptiness... Yeah, dependent arising is is the antidote 
to that grasping at a real me. So, that's one thing that I hope in these nine days you will take away from this, is uh, a more renewed feeling about dependency and dependent arising and how you relate in an interconnected way with other living beings. You know? And maybe some uh, feeling of not being quite so solid. Yeah. And some, maybe some feeling of this life not being so solid. Okay. So this text is what's going to get us towards that understanding. Okay. So it's a Lo Jung, a mind training text. And uh, mind training, it was, it was a whole tradition that sprang up from after Lama Tisha came to Tibet. And uh, spread through all four of the Tibetan traditions. And also in Chinese Buddhism, you know, because the whole idea of training the mind uh, using gatas and applying things to uh, situations on a daily basis in your daily life that's present in all the Buddhist traditions. <clears throat> um, but I must say that personally, uh, I am incredibly grateful to all the people who wrote the mind training texts that I've had the um, privilege of studying because mind training has been, I think, the, the, the basis of my Dharma practice. Yeah, Because if I'm going to keep my precepts as a monastic, yeah, I have to practice mind training. If I'm going to develop the three principal aspects of the path, if I'm going to med- enter Tantra, it all depends on being able to practice the Dharma in our daily lives, whereby we can note the afflictions when they arise and become familiar enough with the antidotes that we can apply them right away. And the mind training teachings are very concise and they really teach you the antidotes in a very clean, clear way. The thing is, if you take even one of the sentences in the mind training, there's so much meaning behind it. (laughs) And if you unpack it, you can, you know teach on one line of the mind training for a whole year because it connects to so many other things. No, for example, yeah, here. So he's talking about the four attachments. So the first one, attachment to this life. Attachment to this life. Four words. Whoa! If you go into that, to understand what attachment to this life is, what it means, what its disadvantages are, what its causes are, what its results are, what its antidotes are. Yeah, you could go on and on and on about attachment to this life. And that's just the first of the four. Yeah. But it's the first one. And you know, sometimes the first ones are really important. <laughs> they, they may appear to be the easiest one because they're first. And you think, oh, you know, they're going to teach us step by step, starting with what's easy, going to what's more difficult. Yeah. Also, oh, getting over attachment to this life. No problem. Really? 
Really? Really? I remember one time being in Bogaya, India, and going around the stupa, and uh, I had these old, crummy, beat-up plastic uh, flip-flops or sandals or something, some cheap, torn-up shoes, completely not attached to them. So I took them off at the gate, did my korwa, my prostrations, came back, and my shoes were gone. All of a sudden, I was attached to those beaten up old plastic sandals. Somebody took them, or somebody threw them away. They are mine! How dare they? And I need them because the asphalt's hot and it's a long way to my room and how am I going to walk there? Yeah. So it's amazing how you can be attached to things that you thought you would never be attached to. Yeah. When I lived in India, okay, early 70s, yeah, a, a toilet paper, yeah, toilet paper has some profound meaning. I mean, look what people are doing now. They're hoarding toilet paper. What's the first thing they went out to buy? Toilet paper. Yeah, we saw all these big pictures of super, you know, baskets full of toilet paper. You know, as if that were going to prevent you from catching the virus. Yeah. So, years ago in India, toilet paper was really something precious. It was, number one, very expensive, and I had very little money. And two, not so easy to get. Yeah, because the Indians didn't use it. Yeah, so it wasn't manufactured so much. Yeah. And being very poor, I had to ration my toilet paper. Toilet paper, really, when you think about it, at least before coronavirus, most people would think I'm not attached to toilet paper. Okay? When you have to ration your toilet paper, you realize you're quite attached to it. When you run out to get it and buy a year's supply of toilet paper, forgetting that your neighbor may actually need some too, then maybe you realize you're very attached to toilet paper. Yeah? So our mind can get attached to anything. So we need to be careful when we think, oh, I'm not attached to this or that. Yeah? Put us in the right situation. We're attached. Anyway, I don't want to start teaching on that first point right now. I'm just trying to do an introduction. Okay. So, how, uh, having given that introduction, which took a half an hour, um, you can see that I am my teacher's student. My teacher gives motivations that last for most of the session, and then talk about the text for the last 15 minutes on a good day. So I, I managed only a half an hour of, of motivation. And we'll have just a couple of minutes of meditation, just to watch your breath and settle the mind.
and then take a moment and recall your dependence on other living beings for your food, your clothing, just even the basic necessities of life. And recall your dependence on all the people who taught you as a child, from parents to caregivers to teachers to friends. And recall that we're interrelated with every single living being, no matter where in this vast universe they are. Because causes and conditions are vast, how we interconnect, how we influence each other is vast. But we're dependent on them, and they're also dependent on us. And so wanting to use our dependence on them and sentient beings dependent on uh, dependence on us in a useful way think that we'll do it through our spiritual practice through aspiring for highest awakening through developing our wisdom and compassion <clears throat> Because as we grow and develop, how we influence and affect others and the benefit that will come from our relationship with others will really increase in quite a beautiful way. So let's have that long-term aspiration. So today I wanted to talk uh, about the Buddhist worldview. Because uh, this worldview is kind of the root of, or the foundation of uh, what we're going to be talking about in the text. And... Uh, the text will make much more sense to you if you have an awareness of the Buddhist worldview. So I realize in the audience there's some people who are probably beginners. There's some people who are very advanced. So I'm kind of talking to everybody. Um, the people, who, Some people may have heard this before, but my experience is that even if we've heard a teaching before, every time I hear it, because I've changed, how I hear the teaching changes. Yeah, And I hear things I didn't hear before, 
or even I hear something I heard before, it goes in in a much deeper way. So it's important to um, approach the teachings with a fresh and curious mind, not a mind that, well, I've heard that before. Why doesn't she teach about something that's exotic and some high, profound teaching? Because I am a high, profound student. Okay. So we'll start out with don't be attached to this life. And we'll see how profound and highly realized we are. Okay. But even before we get to that, the Buddhist worldview. So, from a, a Buddhist viewpoint, what we call the I, the self, yeah, is dependent on two things, a body and a mind. Okay? And based on the body and mind as the basis of designation, we impute I or me. And then that I or me becomes the center of our universe. Fancy that, huh? The body and the mind... Those two things that, that form the basis and dependence on which we label I, or designate I, um, they're different natures. The body is material in nature. The mind is formless. Okay. The two kind of come together in some way that we don't totally understand. I think it has something to do with the wind energies and karma and so on. But based on them coming together in a certain way, then we say a person is alive. I'm alive. Okay? But the body and the mind each have different, uh, are, are part of different causal networks. Because the body is material in nature, its causes are material. And we can trace the causes, material causes of the body, back to the Big Bang, or back to the space particle, depending on which model you use, and even before the Big Bang, yeah, before the origin of this universe, some kind of continuity of matter. Does, when you think of your body like that, that my body is made up of thing, you know, tiny particles, and we don't even know how tiny, uh, that have existed for, uh, you know, ad infinitum and happen to come together in this kind of form. When you think like that, does having a body feel different to you? Yeah? It feels different, doesn't it? Similarly, when we die, yeah, when the body and mind separate, the body has its own continuity, and being something physical or involved in energy, because mass and energy, you know, can go back and forth, it has its own continuity. And basically, either the worms eat it and have a good lunch, or it gets burned and pollutes the sky, and then, you know, maybe falls to the earth and joins with other things again, and so on. Okay? But it's a material causality before and after this body. And even this body is changing moment to moment, not remaining the same. But our mind or our consciousness, uh, it has its own causality. So in the same way that we trace the body 
back to the point of conception, and even before conception, the sperm and egg of our parents. Yeah? Then we trace one moment of mind back to conception, because today's mind depended on yesterday's mind, that depends on the day before mind. Each moment of mind, you know, in the briefest moment, depends, arose from its own cause, the previous moment of mind. And that goes back to the time of conception. Yeah. And then where did that initial moment of consciousness come from that joined with the sperm and egg? Okay, where did it come from? So there's different theories, you know. Uh, Some people say the stork brought it, yeah. Or God created it. Or it's an emergent property of the brain, which I don't understand what that means. Or if you just trace the continuity of consciousness back one moment before another moment before another moment, when you get to the moment of conception, there must have been a moment of consciousness before that. Yeah. And so that was establishes previous life. And a moment before that and a moment before that. Yeah. Similarly, at the time of death, all death is is the body and mind going different directions. Instead of their continuities being, you know, influencing each other as they have while we're alive, they separate. Body has its continuity. The mind, one moment of consciousness, produces the next moment, the next moment, the next moment. And so we go on, when we're ignorant beings, we go on to another rebirth. Yeah, Even we overcome ignorance, still there's a future continuity of consciousness. Yeah, Because the nature of the mind is clear in cognizance. And there's nothing that can stop that continuity. Yeah, there's nothing that can cut the continuity and prevent one moment of consciousness causing a next, the next moment of consciousness. Okay? So either we're reborn under the influence of ignorance and polluted karma, or there's still a continuity of consciousness. Yeah? Our hearts will meditate uh, on emptiness with that consciousness. Bodhisattvas can generate... Uh, Bodhisattvas of a certain level will generate uh, a mental body and manifest forms to benefit sentient beings. Yeah, the Buddha too will manifest um, enjoyment body, an enjoyment body, and many emanation bodies to benefit sentient beings through the power of the mind, because there's the continuity of consciousness. So. You know, the mind is, is something that is quite important. Mm-hmm. So, usually in our life, we pay more attention to external objects. In fact, we are usually totally fixated and preoccupied by external objects and external people. Yeah. And we very seldom really study our consciousness, our mind. And yet, our mind is uh, the creator of our experiences. Yeah. So as we, uh, the consciousness goes from one life to the next, as there's rebirth, yeah, The mind is the creator of our experiences. And it creates our experiences in a couple of ways that relate to what I spoke about earlier about dependence. So one way we create our experience 
is through uh, our actions of body, speech, and mind that leave uh, seeds or latencies on the consciousness. And when the proper cooperative conditions are present, then those seeds and latencies ripen and manifest as what we experience. So they can uh, cause our rebirth, what we're reborn, you know, what realm we're reborn in, um, what we experience in that rebirth, what our habitual tendencies are, what kind of environment we live in, you know, the environment where we take rebirth. So our karma, our actions, our volitional actions, uh, create our experience in that way, in a causal way. Yeah. So it's not that uh, karma created the table, okay? Karma didn't create the table. Um, our friends who are carpenters <laughs> created this table, yeah, and the uh, substantial causes, the wood, and, and so on. But, yeah, why are we here using this table? Why do we have access to the table as an object of use? That has to do with our karma, okay? Oh, and karma principally affects uh, the feeling aggregate. Do we feel happy? Do we feel sad? And so uh, we see there can be the same situation, and two people f experience it very differently. Either experience it in terms of what actually happens physically to them in the situation, or experience it according to uh, whether they feel happy or sad in the situation. Yeah, And uh, I think most of us have had that experience where we go somewhere with some friends and we say, wow, wasn't that terrific? And our friend is like, or our friend says, oh, I had such a good time, that was great. And we're like... You know, we experience the same thing. Why is one person happy and one person not? Yeah, this has to do with the causes we created beforehand. Okay? So virtuous karma creates happy, happiness. Non-virtuous karma creates suffering. So that's one way in which our mind creates our experience, because the mind is what motivates the karma. Yeah, Our body, speech, and mind in the sense of forming a karmic mental action, those things don't happen unless there's motivation in our mind, unless there's intention. And actually, that mental factor of intention is karma. Okay, so that's one way in which the mind influences our experience. Another way is in terms of how we respond to the situation in that very moment. Okay, so there's different ways to respond to the same situation. Yeah, one example, I... Uh, I often give, because at least for me, it's so vivid, is uh, we've had all had the experience of going into a room where we don't know anybody. Okay? So, some people, before they go in the room, yeah, remember sometimes when you were a little kid and your parents were sending you off to day camp or something, and you didn't know anybody? or going to your classroom the first day of school and, you know, going to high school, going to a dance, and you don't, you know, 
you don't know. And even in your career, you know, you have your first day at work and you don't know anybody, or you go to a meeting and you don't know people. So some people approach that experience with, I don't know anybody, and I don't know if I'm going to fit in. I don't know if they're going to like me. They may not like me. I may not fit in. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm going to like them either. And going into a a room where I don't know anybody, I don't feel very safe. That's kind of anxiety-provoking because I don't have the whole situation figured out and how I'm going to fit in and what's going to happen. Okay, so one person thinks like that. Another person, in the exact same situation, says, oh, I'm going into a room where I don't know anybody. And there's going to be a lot of different people from different backgrounds that have had different experiences. And it's going to be really interesting to get to know them and hear about their thoughts, and hear about their background, and what what do they think about life. So one person is anxious beyond belief. You know, are they going to cut me off when I try and say something? Am I going to fit in? And the other person is like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. They're filled with a positive kind of curiosity. Both of them walk in the room. Can you tell how each of them are going to experience? You know, before they even go in the room, what they're going to experience. Pretty much. Sometimes things change. But pretty much the person who is anxious is going to feel like they don't belong and they're going to feel unsafe. And they won't talk to people. And the person who's curious will go in and talk to people. And they may even think, oh, there may be people here who don't know anybody just like me and would like somebody to talk to. And I'll try and go and talk to those people too. Okay? So there there you see, just in the bare situation, how we describe it to ourselves, influences how we experience it. Okay, This is where the thought training teachings come in. Because the mind or thought training teachings are showing us new ways of thinking and new ways of interpreting situations so that we change our immediate experience in them, and so that we create more positive or wholesome karma in situations that will bring about happy results for ourselves and other people. So this is exactly where the mind training practice fits in. Okay? So, when we talk about the body and mind, yeah, um, we wind up talking about rebirth. Yeah, and that is uh, a fundamental um, perspective from, from the Buddhist worldview. Now, many of us, myself included, did not grow up with any idea of rebirth. Yeah, um, my origin or religion of origin didn't talk much about rebirth, and then I was quite interested in science, and I thought, you know, when you die, it's nothing. The body's a corpse. You know, there, there's no conscious experience after that. Zip. Okay, uh, but that. That's what I really believe for many, many years. It didn't create a real good feeling in my mind. Yeah, because I kept thinking if (coughs) 
after I die there's nothing, then what's the purpose of my life? <coughs> because it was clear to me that when you die, your body doesn't come with you because we're not our body. And it's very clear when you die that all your possessions and friends don't come with you either. Uh, so what in the world, what is the purpose of my life while I'm alive if, you know, there, there's nothing that happens afterwards? Or even, you know, if anything you do in this life, the only effect it has is some immediate effect, then, you know, okay, be kind to your neighbor. That made sense. But I don't know. There was such a feeling of vacuity of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to my first meditation course, and they talked about rebirth, even though I had never heard anything about it before, the idea really intrigued me. And uh, the teacher said, think about it. You don't have to believe it. Think about it. See if it makes sense. And the more I thought about it, it was like, wow, you know, rebirth really makes sense. Yeah, why? Because based on causality, yeah, the body has its causes that are material. It produces effects that are material in nature. The consciousness has its causes which are not material. It has its effects after death, continuity of consciousness, also not material. Yeah? And to me, that just made sense, you know? Because causes, things, that, causes and effects have to match. They have to be concordant. Yeah? And for me, the idea of a permanent uh, creator of the world which I really tried to believe in as a child. You know, I tried. But I wasn't very successful in believing in it because it just didn't make any sense. Yeah? And, uh, you know, because you just start asking questions like, why did God create us? And what kind of answers do you get? Yeah? So I went around to several different spiritual leaders. Now, why did God create us? Uh, 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 what's the next question? <laughs> or it's a mystery. Or God was lonely. God was lonely. He wanted company. But God was also perfect, so how can he be lonely? Yeah. Well, then, why did God create suffering? If he could do whatever he wanted because he was omnipotent, why did he create suffering? Well, he wanted us to learn. Well, why didn't he create us smarter? <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I realize that theism, you know, helps some, some people. It resonates with some people. That's great. I'm just saying it didn't resonate with me. But when I started hearing about rebirth and karma and the fact that our mind is the source of our experience. Yeah. And that we have some power and some influence over our experience, either by working karmically with creating 
virtuous causes or by changing our interpretation and how we're seeing a situation the moment, you know, at the time it's actually happening. When I saw that, it was like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah. So I'm encouraging you to think about it. Because a view of rebirth, at least for me, made a lot of things make sense. If it doesn't make sense, put it on the back burner. Don't reject it. Just put it on the back burner. Continue to practice and study and use the aspects of Buddhism that speak to you. But every once in a while, come back and think about rebirth because you've changed and how you see rebirth may have changed too. Hearing some stories of, uh, of people who remembered past lives too was very, very interesting. Yeah. And uh, some of you may have read even Stevenson's book or, you know, there's various different stories and things on the web that we can read about. But one thing that really influenced me was one time, this again was many years ago, um, I was asked to give a talk at a library in Florida. And the audience was mostly elderly people. This was Florida. They all go to retire. And uh, so they, they asked me to speak about rebirth. So I talked about that. And then afterwards, one woman came up to me. And she said, you know, I'm not, I never thought about rebirth. I'm not a Buddhist. But what you said really makes sense. Because my son, when he was, since he was a really little baby, he had this incredible aptitude towards music. And he can sit down and just play music. And he, she said, I remember in New York getting in a taxi and, you know, some piece of classical music was on the radio. And he said he could identify that was Beethoven's or you know, Brahms or whoever it was, Sonata, whatever, knows number, what, this and that. And she said, I could never figure out how my child knew all these pieces of classical music and how he could play music so easily because nobody in our family is inclined that way and nobody taught him. She said, but when you talked about rebirth, I began to think, oh, there must have been seeds from his previous life that manifested when he was a little kid. Yeah. And she said, now I understand my son better. So hearing that from her, you know, and her experience, that, that really uh, touched me. Yeah. And then also, as <clears throat> I teach in different situations, yeah, in the East and the West, um, the question always comes, how come we're here? Yeah. I mean, most of the, we have, <clears throat> you know, most of the people in this room did not grow up Buddhist. I'm su suspecting most of the people, you know, who are listening online did not grow up Buddhist. Okay. Um, so then, if there's if there's no rebirth, then there's only nature. You know, your genes, your body, something physical that would cause your interest in Buddhism, or nurture, something you learn during your life. So nature or nurture. Well, my mother, when I became a Buddhist, reminded me many times 
that there are absolutely positively no Buddhists in my genealogy. She was very sure about that. Okay? So cross out nature, you know, no Buddhist genes for me. Nurture. Okay. What, you know, well, let's stay with nature for a minute. You know, do any of you have Buddhist genes? Yeah, in your ancestry? Maybe, you know, maybe you have to go to, what is it, 23 and Me, or, you know, take a swab thing. And, but they don't have Buddhist genes. You know, they'll tell you kind of areas of the world you may be from. Okay. But even then, even if you're from areas of the world where there was Buddhism, you know, did you learn it through, did it pass to you through your genes? Yeah. Then nurture. Okay. How did you grow up? Yeah. The environment I grew up in? No Buddhists. Okay. No Buddhists. Um, I think I may have seen something Buddhist in a social studies class, maybe in junior high or high school or something. Yeah, no Buddhist influence at all in my upbringing. Yeah, in your upbringing, any Buddhist influence? The Beatles were meditating. What? The Beatles were meditating. The Beatles were meditating, but what kind of meditation were they doing? <laughs> yeah. So there was, because uh, all meditation is not Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, why is it that here's a bunch of people who know nature and know nurture, and here we are, yeah, at least in this room, yeah, a room full of monastics and one monastic wannabe. <laughs> yeah? So why is that? And all the lay people are listening to the teachings, you know. Why are you interested in Buddhism? Nature? Nurture? Yeah. We may be able to point to a few things that happened in this culture where we first encountered Buddhism. Okay? Because, you know, for me it was a flyer in a bookstore. Or, well, actually the very first thing was seeing things in Nepal when I was, uh, you know, in Nepal in the early 70s. Um, so that may be, be the first thing that makes you know that Buddhism exists or makes you interested in it. But what accounts for, you know, just the, the way it clicked with us? Yeah. So I think there, too, we can get some kind of feeling uh, about karma. <clears throat> mm hmm? The Tibetans have a, a slogan. If you want to know, um, how does it go? If you want to know what? If you want to know, understand your present body. Your past life. Look at your body. Right, okay, yes. I always get this confused. If you want to understand your previous life body, look at. No, no, it's not like that because one is mind and one. If you want to know, if you want to understand your present body, look for look at your past mind. If you want to understand your present mind, your future. Okay. Anyway, I'm, what is it? If you, it's not your past, it's your future. If you want to. Understand your future body, look at your present mind. 
Oh, that's it. And if you want to understand your past life, look at your present body. Okay, thank you. It takes a room full of people to teach the Dharma. Um, <laughs> okay. In other words, <laughs> yeah, the whole thing is, uh, you know, whoever we were, not just in one life, but probably over many lifetimes in the past, uh, we could tell that person created ethical conduct because we have a human body and upper rebirth now. Yeah. We can tell that that person practiced generosity because we have enough food to eat now. <coughs> so we, we can look at our, our present experiences you know, and tie them to previous causes. And then we also need to look at what am I doing now? What kind of causes am I creating for the future that I want to become? Yeah, because this is the other aspect where we have some influence. Yeah. Okay. So there, I just talked a little bit about the worldview, uh, Buddhist worldview in terms of rebirth. There's many more aspects of the Buddhist worldview, okay? But we'll get into those tomorrow. I wanted to um, see if there's questions first. So people online, I think you can type in your questions. Is that right? Yeah, you can type them in and Venerable Lamsa will read them out or you people can... So, rebirth is one aspect of the Buddhist worldview. Uh, the whole idea of sentient beings being interconnected that I spoke about at the beginning today, that's another aspect. Yeah. And uh, this also fits in with another aspect <laughs> of the Buddhist worldview, is, which is that although things appear to have their own nature and to be objectively existent, in fact, uh, they don't exist that way. Okay? So the whole idea of things being empty, yeah, yet still arising, still existing. So this is uh, another aspect of the Buddhist worldview that's very important. There's a question. Let me finish this point first then. So in terms of, uh, you know, even bodhicitta and cultivating compassion for others, one of the things that impedes us, in addition to the self-centered thought, is the self-grasping at our level because we feel that there's a real me, yeah, solid me, and we need to protect that me. So we get attached to anything that brings the I or the me happiness. We have aversion for anything that... Uh, interferes with our happiness or causes us pain. And so that uh, factors in to how we treat other living beings. Yeah, because we want to, you know, other living beings, sure, they help us, but they can also harm us. So we better protect ourselves against them because there's this great big I that ob exists objectively that can be threatened. Yeah. And it's very interesting to look at our concept, you know, of that I. When you feel anxious and fearful, when you feel unsafe, to sit there and just say, who feels unsafe? Who is anxious? Yeah. Because it feels like there's a real me there. 
But when we try and identify exactly what that me is, what that I is, it kind of gets vague. Yeah. So I'll talk more about that, but now to the question. Well, yeah. there's a few now. <laughs> um, the first one is, if we can't speak clearly to the scientific argument against rebirth, how can we be sure of it? Is there a scientific argument against rebirth? I haven't heard one. The, the most I've heard is, uh, we can't see it. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And scientific instruments are very good at measuring either very tiny material things or very large material things, but they can't measure things that are not material, like the consciousness. So how through scientific instruments can you prove that there's no continuity of consciousness? All the best you could say is, I don't see it. Or, you know, some scientists will say, it's a product, it's a, um, and it's an emergent property of the brain. What in the world does that mean, to be an emergent property of the brain? Yeah, I've asked some scientists, I can't get a real clear thing, except somehow we went from, you know, one-celled creatures, uh, you know, and got more complex bodies, and then finally the brain, the you know, with big brains, and then the mind came out of the brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question is, um, if we are all connected, I think it's possible to help those who are dying, but they are not Buddhists, so how does it work? Okay. So, um, we are first of all a sentient being. Okay? Sentient beings can help other sentient beings. We, don't have, we, we aren't restricted to just helping Buddhists. Yeah. When people are dying, you know, so if we take the situation of helping people who are close to death, we can talk to them about, you know, whatever spiritual view that makes sense to them. Yeah. If they believe in God or Jesus or the prophet Muhammad or whatever, we talk in their language. But what we talk about is having Forgiveness, having love, having compassion, you know, say goodbye to everything in this life, know that everybody will be fine, you just go on to your next life, we're sending you off with love, rejoice in everything virtuous that you did in this life, you know, apologize to the people you need to apologize to, forgive the people you need to forgive. You know, if you want to learn how to help people when they're dying, Venerable Sangha Kadro is giving a course on that starting Friday night and going through Saturday and Sunday, and I recommend, you know, joining our course. Okay? So it doesn't matter if somebody's Buddhist or not, how we talk to them when they're dying. When, when people are alive and they have problems, when they're angry, we can talk about so many of the mind training techniques with, without talking anything Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, you know, samsara, nirvana, karma. You don't need to use any specifically Buddhist words. We just talk common sense. We talk as one sentient being to another because we have similar experiences and we care about each other. Um, so I won't be able to ask all the questions that are here, but I'll pick and, okay. pick and choose Yeah, some. we could do a few, and then the rest of them you could write down. And, okay. Yeah. Um, I've realized I'm attached to being right, especially when it comes to how to prevent people from being hurt. It causes me suffering, and I'm afraid to hurt others along the way. How can I deal with this? So if somebody's attached to being right, 
especially when it comes about how to prevent others from getting hurt. Like they're right about how to prevent others getting hurt, I think. Okay. Hmm? Okay, so somebody's a caretaker of somebody else, and they know how to treat that person who's injured or something like that. Okay, I, I hope, because this is the kind of question where somebody's at, the asker is thinking about a particular situation, but I don't know what that situation is. So I don't know if my answer is going to fit the question. Okay, but but I can talk about attached being attached to being right. Okay, because I do have that problem because I am right all the time. Okay, why am I right? Because I'm me. Okay, and I would never be wrong. Yeah, would you ever be wrong? Would you ever be wrong? No, none of us would ever choose to be wrong. So we're always right. And we may have several pieces of paper to prove that we're right. Or we may have, like the American president, great intuition that knows that we're right. Don't make a face. (laughs) Yes, that's a better smile. (laughs) You should have seen her face. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, but what does right mean? To be really right, you really have to be a Buddha because you have to know all the different causes and conditions. Okay, because, I mean, because things can change on a dime. Look at how this virus appeared in Europe or in the, in the States. You know, we all knew what was going on in China. But, you know, and there are a few people who say, oh, it's going to come here. And we didn't believe it. But we were right. We were right. Why do we I need to pay attention to all those people, you know, telling horror stories? Because it's not going to happen here. And we're right, and so we don't prepare. Okay? Being right is actually difficult. Because you have to know so many causes and conditions of so many different factors that you've never even thought of before. Okay? So the most we can be is approximately right. (laughs) And you never know you're right if you're right or wrong until afterwards. Yeah? Because being right means you have to have reliable cognizers. Yeah? (laughs) I don't say valid cognizers. I say reliable cognizers. But often we don't know until after the fact if our cognizers were Reliable or not. Okay. Just ask any weather person. They predict the weather. Everybody runs their life according to what the weatherman thinks. Yeah, and it's the only job where you can always be wrong and keep your job. (sighs) Yeah. So maybe loosen a little bit about being right. And I know for myself, many times, you know, I'm sure my idea is the right way. And, but everybody else wants to do it another way. So I have a little thing that I say to myself sometimes, which is, I hope I'm wrong. Can you imagine that saying, I hope I'm wrong? When you know you're always right. But, you know, in some situations, I hope I'm wrong because the way I'm seeing the situation is limited and what I'm coming up with is not so good. And actually, at the end of the day, I really don't know what I'm talking about. 
So I don't know if that fits the person who asked the question. <laughs> okay, we'll do one more question. Would any realizations of thought training that we develop in this life carry over to our next lives, or do we need to cultivate them again starting from the beginning? Okay, it depends. That's an excellent question. It depends on how familiar we become with them in this life. Okay? The more we plant the seeds of the thought training techniques in our mind in this life, the easier they will arise in future life. And the easier they will just affect our whole way of looking at life uh, in the future life. Yeah? Because what we're very much uh, creatures of familiarity. So the more we familiarize ourselves with something, the more easily it arises in our mind. Yeah. So, he, so this is a point where we have some control. If we want thought training techniques to carry on into our next life, we got to practice them really diligently in this life. If we only kind of try it once or twice and then it doesn't work so well and we give up, then forget it. Yeah. It's like learning to drive a car. You can't sit down and drive a car perfectly the first time, even though you think you can, you know, and you're sure you're right. You know, all the teenagers who go joyriding, yeah, they're sure they can drive well. Yeah, but it's very much a thing of habituation and familiarization. So then that's on even an ordinary skill, let alone something like thought training. <laughs>